Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The format of this meeting is two 10-minute speakers followed by our information break, and then our main speaker who will speak for 30 minutes. Our first 10-minute speaker is Alex M. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm an alcoholic. Um, Okay, so I got sober in 1991 on March 15th. My sponsor is Lisa Limbrinos. My grand sponsor is Marlena. I guess that makes makes my great-grand sponsor Clancy. But I've only met him once, and he told me that my nose ring looked like a booger. <laughs> took me a long time to get over that one. Um, I was born with, like most of you probably, just too many feelings. I was just, I just came out, I had way too many feelings, they were very painful, and I didn't know what to do with them. My parents, my mother was a psychoanalyst with an MD, Freudian. My father was... Um, a family doctor, and so they didn't know what to do with me either, so they did what they thought was right. So they sent me to analysis, Freudian, from first to sixth grade, five days a week, to talk about my feelings. And people would say to me, like, when I was a little girl, they'd say, how are you? And I'd say, not very good, but it's okay because I talk about it. So... Moving ahead, I was very unhappy, tried a lot of different things, mostly a lot of fantasy. You know, I really just lived in my head. And when I was about nine years old, I discovered my parents' liquor cabinet. And I had, you know, been watching Dynasty, and I had, you know, known what a mixed drink was. So I went and I made a mixed drink. I took some vermouth and some peppermint schnapps and some vodka and scotch, you know, and I put it all together, and I drank it, and the most amazing thing happened. It it was like the next thing I knew, I was okay. I just was okay, and it was that kind of relief that I was just like, that's it. That's what I need. I need a mixed drink, so... I was maybe, you know, I was nine years old, so halfway through my drink, I, you know, was reeling around the house, and my mom realized what was going on, and the next thing I know, I'm vomiting in the toilet, and she's holding my hair and saying, well, you know, it's it's good that you experimented, because, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so it's good that you experimented, but now you see what happens, you throw up, and, you know, I'm thinking, so what, you know, that's all I have to do, I'll, whatever, so... I basically just went on from there. I I just, you know, learned how to drink. And my parents actually don't drink at all. And the funny thing was, you know, I did the water thing where you keep putting the water in the bottle. When I was about 21 or 22, I was home from college, and I, you know, I could drink. It was legal. So I made myself like a vodka tonic. And it was all water. (laughs) I was like, don't you guys buy any liquor? So... I spent, you know, my high school years, I somehow struggled through high school. Um, I got into college. I actually didn't get into college. I actually got into continuing education where I stopped drinking for a year because everybody I knew left to go to school, and I was the only person in my parents' house with no friends. So I really didn't even drink. I drank very controlled, and I got straight A's, and I cleaned my apartment with, like, a Q-tip. I was, like, so tightly wrapped. And so I got good grades, and I got into a college where I could go away. And I went away to college, and I discovered nightclubs. I discovered the world of, um, I don't know if any of you know D.C., but it was tracks. And And I was just a a screaming fag hag, and I was Edie Sedgwick. And, you know, I just had my little crew of friends, And we just had so much fun, and I barely remember any of it. 
I did become a nightclub promoter. I kind of like, you know, I just did this whole thing. This whole time my parents are paying for me to be in college. And so I'm Edie Sedgwick. So I don't know if any of you were Edie Sedgwick too, but she was a trust fund kid and she was one of Andy Warhol's muses. So I like allotted one of my friends, you know, to be Andy Warhol and he just ran around yelling fabulous at everybody. And, you know, I just kept going on and on. And then the worst thing ever happened, I graduated. So that was a problem. Um, so I kind of hung around and stuff, but my parents sort of wanted me to get a job, and I was just in like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I eventually ended up at a nightclub. Um, I don't know. I was just 98 pounds. I drank, I lived above two liquor stores, I had running tabs, I drank like a bottle of gin before I went out, that was just to put the mascara on, and I went to a nightclub, and somebody, we were dancing, someone handed me a popper, and before you know it, I'm like on the floor, and I ended up in the manager's office with like some cocktail waitress who was like there to watch over me, and I just, I couldn't breathe, and I wanted them to take me to the hospital, and they wouldn't do it because it was the opening of the club and they didn't want, you know, bad press. So I sat there like, you know, holding on and friends kept coming in and they kept going, oh my God, that was fabulous. And I was like, oh my God, these people, if I died, it would be so much better for them. They're not my friends. You know, like big revelation for me. So I went home that night and I woke up in the middle, like, 8 o'clock in the morning, which to me was, like, really, really early. And, of course, I was surrounded by the miscellaneous people who just, whatever, fell asleep on my waterbed and stuff. And I found that I had been collecting AA literature. Now, this was unbeknownst to me, but it used to be at 4 o'clock in the morning, they used to do, like, do you have a drinking problem? And, you know, these PSA service announcements. And apparently I had been calling the number. And so I had this literature, and there was a meeting schedule. So I went to the meeting, and um, they didn't understand how fabulous I was, and they didn't know, they didn't drink the same kinds of drinks that I did, and they didn't understand the pressure of fabulousness. And I just was like, I can't relate to this. And they suggested that perhaps I go to a meeting in another part of town. So I did, and, you know, basically what happened was I discovered I was an alcoholic, but I didn't stay. All I found out was it ruined my drinking. And so then I was stuck, and I had to figure out what I could do. I tried all these different dry goods. Nothing worked. Eventually I ended up in Los Angeles because I figured by moving there, I would, through osmosis, be jogging on the beach eating granola. And... <laughs> they have nightclubs there, too. So I I ended up there. I ended up in an AA meeting, and it was called Rodeo. And it was so fabulous. I mean, these people were beautiful, and they were celebrities, and everybody was talking to everybody, and I was so intimidated. I was like, this is it for me. So, you know, whatever keeps you coming, you know. And my first sponsor was in the Pacific Group. Yeah, she had just left the Pacific Group, but she was still, like, very Pacific Group. So she was like, okay, how many days a week did you drink? And I said, every day. And she said, okay, so you have to go to a meeting every day that you drank, so you have to go to a meeting every day. You have to be there half an hour early. You have to save me a seat. You have to save my friend a seat. You have to raise your hand as a newcomer. You have to thank the birthday person. You have to thank the speaker. You have to, like, get a commitment. You have to call everybody who gives you their phone number, and you have to, like, get an egg timer, and you're only allowed to talk for 10 minutes on the phone, and then you have to hang up. That was the hardest part. I was, like, in the middle of my whole story, and it was like, ding! I was like, oh, i got to go. Bye. <laughs> so, so, in short, a couple of things I want to mention before I get off. I wanted to mention a few things that I heard in Los Angeles that I don't hear out here, but it was really great. And one of them was uncover, discover, discard. And that was so important for me because so often when I'm new, when I was new, I found things horrible. And you know, really, it, it's all about the process. It's uncovering it, discovering what it is, and then getting rid of it. 
And then there's this part where you're doing that and you enter this dark room and the door closes behind you and they call it the hallway. And you're waiting for that next door to open and it's not. I was told to decorate. So that's what I did. You know, I just learned how to be uncomfortable. I learned how to walk through things. And now, by the grace of God, I'm married. I have two beautiful children. I have this life that I never dreamed of because, honestly, I didn't think I was going to make it to 30. I mean, really, I was planning. Edie, I don't think, made it to 30, so, you know. So I wasn't planning to make it to 30. So now everything that happens to me is a gift. And the other thing that, the last thing I want to say is that they told me to wear my sobriety loosely. And I, I had no idea what they meant. And it took a long time for me to really get that. But now I realize that it's just about enjoying the ride. And I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for listening to me. Our second 10-minute speaker is Matt L. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and by the grace of God, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, especially rooms like this, and strong sponsorship, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since September 19th, 2004. And for that, I'm really grateful. And uh, actually, you've heard that um, a couple of times traveling, um, especially just recently up in Pockets of Enthusiasm. All right, which I've been to the last three years in a row, and I will keep going back because it's just an amazing gift. It's an amazing gift to be away with people from this room, um, to be enjoying sobriety. And that's what we do. Um, and, and to talk about, you know, wearing sobriety loosely, I mean, to get away and, and to do that is such a gift. Um, I'm going to share uh, my experience, strength, and hope with you. Uh, what it was like, like the book says, uh, I'm going to disclose in a general way what it was like what happened, and what it's like now. God, I'm so nervous. I, I, you know, I've done this a couple of times here. Uh, you just have a great commitment up here where I got a podium, and it never gets comfortable. And thank God, because then my ego would just be like, it's, it's bad enough, but it would be worse if that's possible. Okay, so I was born to... <laughs> we'll take it all the way back. All right. I was born to uh, two alcoholic parents, um, hippies, and uh, yeah, all right, and uh, they moved from their little one-bedroom apartment out to, the, my mom's dad loaned them, them some money, and they moved out to a house out in Comac, Long Island, and uh, my mom, uh, they totally did not fit in. They decided they had a glass screen door they painted, peace to all who enter here, and this was like a Catholic Jewish neighborhood where everyone was like very prim and proper. And here's my mom with the braids and the, and my dad with the curls who look like Roger Daltrey and like the, Tommy the movie. And, um, so I was like totally, you know, growing up, all of a sudden I'm like totally this stranger and that weird kid and that kid of those weird parents. And, uh, to be an alcoholic and to have that gene, because I believe we are born with this thing, you know, it is a disease that we're born with didn't make anything very easy for me. Um, I was also the smallest kid. I uh, wasn't a very good athlete, and I just did not fit in. So uh, when liquor presented itself to me at an early age, I think uh, around I was uh, 13 or 14 years old, um, not the first drink I ever had, but the first drunk I ever had, the time to really get it going. It's a block party in my neighborhood. I got invited by some of the older kids, and I got really drunk, and we and it was like the early 80s, and it was heavy metal music, and it was like Black Sabbath, Iron Man, and I'm like drinking my beer and just getting going, and sure enough, I drank way too much, and I puked, and I got really sick, and I had to get carried home, and it was it was a mess, and I was a mess, and you know, I, I was really like not feeling very well the next day, and by all means, I should not have ever drank again after that, but you know what? I was cool. I was hanging out with cool people, and uh, and it did for me what I was not being able to do for myself at that time. And uh, I chased that feeling for many years, and uh, I started getting into a lot of trouble. And um, my parents ended up 
my making some money, and they went from like hippies to like preppies, you know. Then it became like the late 80s, and it was like yuppies. And uh, they moved to a nicer house, so we moved to a different neighborhood, and um, I started getting in trouble. My parents didn't know what to do with me. They sent me to boarding school. And sure enough, they didn't know what to do with me, so they sent me overseas. The bad boarding school was like, oh, we have a great program for you. It's in London. Your son, Matthew, would be perfect for this. So they shipped me off to London, and um, I got there, and and I uh, found that you could drink. They had they had lager in soda cans that came from the dispensing machine. So I started drinking uh, in between classes there, and I got in trouble, and uh, before... Before they decided to throw me out, though, I was getting into fights pretty much every day. I was like the yank, and I didn't fit in, and all these other things. And um, I, uh, I said, you know what? If uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt a suicide because that'll get them to throw me out of here. Like, they wouldn't listen to me. My parents wouldn't listen to me. They wouldn't take me home. And sure enough, I did that, and they sent me to the hospital. And then the school was just like, you know what? We've had enough of them. And the school back in Long Island that did the transfer thing said we had enough with them. And I went back to public school. And then my parents get this great idea. They made some more money. They decided to move to a nicer house, like, further into Nassau County. And uh, this is senior year, and I was, like, the new kid in a new school in senior year. And it was just, like, at that point, I was just off to the races. I didn't fit in, and I just drank, and, and I picked up drugs at that time, too. And it's a big part of my story, and I won't talk about it. But the bottom line is I chased that feeling um, from through my 20s into my 30s until I got into... Um, this very destructive relationship where uh, I was told, you know, you really need to look into drinking. This is the first time in all my life that anyone really cared about me to tell me that I should do that. And I went to see a therapist. I went to see a psychiatrist because I thought I didn't have a drinking problem, but I had a psychological problem. And then he would fix me, give me a pill or something like that. And sure enough, he did give me some pills. But he said to me, you know what, you have a, uh, you have a, another problem. You're an addict. And, uh, and you are an alcoholic, probably, and I want you to at least, uh, ch- I want to check you into a hospital. And I was like, way too vain to go into a hospital, you know, for a program. So it's like, well, why don't you go see at least my drug and alcohol therapist? And I did that. And I went to see him, and, and he told me that, you know, after I shared with him a couple of times, a couple of weeks, he said, I can't help you with what you have. Uh, the only way that you're going to get help is by going to AA. And that is like, there's a story in the big book that talks about that. And this doctor, had, you know, therapist had enough lacking of ego to tell me to do that. And he saved my life. And sure enough, you know, I didn't listen to him right away, of course. And then I went to see him a couple more times and he told me, look, you're just wasting your time here and, and you need to go to AA. And I said to him, you know, but I'm giving you money. And he's like, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you're wasting my time. Forget about your money. So I did listen to him. I went to a, a, a meeting and then... I kind of liked it a little bit, you know. Um, yeah, I, I audited the rooms of AA for about a few months, but I didn't do anything that they told me to do. I didn't get, you know, I didn't, I got a sponsor who gave me a business card. I thought I could get business from him. So guy gave me a business card. I'm like, well, he could be a good candidate. So I asked him to be my sponsor. But I didn't get a home, I didn't really get, you know, get him active in a home group. I didn't get a commitment. I didn't do anything uh, that they told me. And sure enough, uh, I thought it was after five months of to reward myself with a trip to Bahamas for the weekend by myself. And uh, I got there and I got off the elevator. I got I got changed and I was going to the beach. You know, it was the first day there. And I got into the elevator and there were these two girls and they're like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, where are you going? They're like, we're going to buy alcohol. Where are you going? I'm like, I'm going with you guys. So there went my five, you know, non-strong months in AA. And it was uh, it was back to off the races. You know, the book talks about how we never get better, we get worse. And I got worse. And uh, I came to a point where I um, I, I, I had like a, a really bad night and I blacked out and I, I woke up. I didn't know where I was and what was going on. And uh, I called a friend of mine and he told me, you know, go, why don't you try to go back to AA? And he also recommended that I call his sponsor at the time, who was a member of this group, who told me to meet him outside his apartment. I'll never forget, I drove back into the city. I was working in Long Island that day, and I, he came out of my car. It was pouring rain. It was like thundering out, and it was like ominous. And he's like, you know, if you want to get sober, you're going to do this. And for some reason, I listened to him. And uh, sure enough, I came here, and uh, it was a big room. And if you're new, it's like, you know, I got here, and it was like scary and everything like that. But you know what? I finally found what I was, what I, what I needed. And I started to slowly get better. And that was because 
He took me through the steps. We did the steps of, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, as they're laid out in the big book. And, uh, and my life started to change. Um, my, my, most, uh, my best step experience was uh, in doing the ninth step with my father before he died. Um, and he told me, you know, my sponsor told me that when you're uh, doing an amends, ask, um, is there anything I left out and is there anything I could do to make this up to you? And my father said, just stop, you know, stop messing with your mom. Be a man already. And, uh, you know, he died slowly after that, and I got an opportunity to do that, and that would have never have happened. This was a woman who she used to call. I look at myself and I'm like, click, ignore. You know, I, I would never, um, I would never like even uh, been able to deal with that. And because of AA and because of the steps, I'm able to deal with that now and be the man that she needs me to be. And, uh, you know, I'm really grateful. Um, I've gotten some crazy news just recently that, uh, that I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do or how I'm going to get through it. But just like with my dad's death and everything else because of sobriety, I know that God's going to take care of me and everything's going to be okay. So thank you all. Good night. Our main speaker tonight is Linda. Hi, family. My name is Linda, and I'm an alcoholic. Wow. All right, I just need to get that out the way. Uh, my home group is the Rosedale Springfield Group in Queens. And my sober date is September 11th, 1991. September 11th is a good day. Um, I had my first drink when I was 16 years old at 8 o'clock in the morning. And prior to that, I thought drinking in the morning for a kid in school was not a good thing, but my thinking changed. And I went from going to Catholic school to going to public school, and I didn't fit in. So I had this can of Colt 45, and I drank it, and I got to school late, and I weaved my way down the hall, and I ran into the assistant principal. He said, why aren't you in class? I said, why don't you mind your business? <laughs> so the first drink had some interesting after effects. Uh, I got that nice buzz, but uh, I got in trouble, and then I proceeded to throw up all over the principal's office. So I didn't know anything about an allergy to alcohol, but I had it from the very beginning. So um, I'm drinking, not daily, but when we had little hooky parties where we would cut school and go to people's houses and drink. Um, the reason I had changed from Catholic school to public school was because I got pregnant. And back in those days, you weren't allowed to be pregnant in Catholic school. Um, so I was filled with a lot of shame and a sense of responsibility. And my life changed from how every one of my friend's lives were at that point. And I, my parents put my son in foster care. I was not allowed to bring him home. So I was very angry and very confused. And But I, I went to school. I did okay, and um, I graduated. Got a job in a bank, got my son out of foster care. So now it's me and my son against the world. And, uh, you know, I'm working, and I got plucked very early out of the secretarial pool. I was a platform secretary, and I got put into a management training program. And my career took off. So I was this young mother. I was the president of the PTA at my son's school. I wore very expensive suits and carried a briefcase every day. I had a secretary and an expense account. And by the age of 26, you couldn't talk to me. I had arrived. Uh, um, I didn't go straight to college um, after high school, even though I got accepted everywhere I applied because I was really too smart for college. And I come from a family of educators, so this was not something that made them happy. Um, but at 21, 22, I started going to college at night. You know, being in this management training program kind of exposed me to other people who had degrees, and I began to realize it might be important to go to college. So this is how I went to college. We had a student lounge. I would stop in the student lounge, and I brought my wine flask with me, 
and I drank wine, and I played cards, and there were some other substances around. And this is how we went to, we never went to class. And so that's how I did college. And I showed up when I heard they had a test, and I would get an 85 or 90 without even going to class. So of course, after a while I said, who needs college? I was smarter than the professors. And, uh, and I eventually stopped going. But my career continued to progress. I'm coming home every day after work. Excuse me. And before I could check homework, cook dinner, or anything else, I had to have a glass of wine. If you talked to me before I had the glass of wine, you got all my agitation, irritation from the day, because everything and everybody bothered me in the world. When I left my house in the morning and got to the bus stop, the bus should be pulling up. I should not have to wait. When I got to the train, I should not have to push through people to get inside the train. You should move because I have arrived. Uh, people used to say, she's so arrogant, and I thought arrogant B was a compliment. Um, it got to be after a while that I couldn't wait until I got home to have that drink at the end of a long day where I had to deal with people. So um, I found out about places like McCann's and other places that had ladies two for one and two hours of drinking. So then I would do that. I would go after work and I would drink for two hours. And at that time, this is many years ago, I would get in my car and drive home from downtown to Queens in about 12 minutes. Now, the only way you could do that is if you don't pay attention to red light stop signs or pedestrians, for that matter. So that I drove fast all the time, and I always got home. I never had a DWI, never had an accident, so there was no problem. There were things that I prided myself on, you know, paying bills, paying rent, being an upstanding member of my community. People used to say, oh, there goes Linda. You know, I was like someone that you would look up to. But that, that was starting to change. Um, I was going out a lot. I, this is also the disco era for me. And a strange thing started happening called blackouts. But I didn't know anything about blackouts. So I would go to a club. Well, first, let me just tell you, how I went out is I spent a few hours tuning up in my apartment. So the music is really loud. I don't care if it's bothering anyone else, because it's my music and it's my apartment. Turn the music up really loud. Drink get dressed, go out, throw up in the bathroom, on the floor, in my fine clothes, and then drink some more and party. This is how I partied. But every once in a while, I would start out at a club in Midtown Manhattan, and I would kind of come to and I'd be in New Jersey. Now, how I got to New Jersey, where my car is, who these people are, I had no, I had no clue. And it was a little frightening, but another drink scared away the fright. Um, so things got worse. You know, I used to have very good credit. My home was immaculate. My son was a good student. You know, all these things were fine, but they were fine on the outside. Inside, I was a raging maniac. I was angry. I was jealous. Every time I got a promotion, I wanted more money, and how come I don't have the job that you have? And Now, I didn't tell you, there, there wasn't a God in my life. Even though I went to Catholic school, because my mom died when I was 12. And I was very angry at God of why he would take this young mother of four children and leave murderers and rapists on the street. I couldn't figure it out. So I had no use for God. So any time I got into any kind of little scrape or whatever, Linda was the higher power. Linda could figure out, because she's very smart, that's going to be important later in the story. <laughs> Linda could figure out problems. People in my family came to me with problems. I was the oldest child, you know, and I was the source. So, um, and for a long time, I could figure my way out of problems, and I could stop drinking for a little while and get things together when they got a little crazy, and then I'd drink again. So this proceeded, but this is a progressive disease, and it got worse. And, you know, Con Edison was sending me bills now, and I'm getting a resentment, like, why are they bothering me? Didn't I send them money last month? I said, they have millions of dollars. Why do they need my $60? And then um, 
I used to live in this two-family house in Queens, and my landlady lived next door. And how I would pay her is I'd put a money order or a check, or sometimes cash in an envelope, slide it under her door, stick it in her mailbox. You know, we were kind of friends. But it got to the point that I would put the money in an envelope and put it under her door, and if she didn't get it in like five minutes, I would go get a hanger and slide it back out. And my thinking said that she should have got it while it was in there. So, you know, land, landladies and landlords were asking me to leave now, you know, and I was packing up from a five-room apartment to a four-room to a three-room, and uh, I would put furniture in storage. I wouldn't pay the bill or I'd pay it late, so I started losing things. And one night, I went into my son's room, who was now 17 at the time. When he was 17, I was 33. And he got accepted to college, and he had a little part-time job, and I went in his room in the middle of the night, and I robbed him. Now, when I went in his room, I knew it was wrong, and I had been my, protecting my son from the world for 17 years. You could not mess with my son. But I had now become the enemy. And I was filled with shame, guilt, and remorse while I did it, but I couldn't stop. And I rationalized and justified this behavior by saying, oh, I'm putting a roof over his head, I'm paying the bills, I'm buying the clothes, and I'm going to pay it back. That was the th thinking. But when he woke up in the morning, my six foot three son, and he saw that his mother had robbed him, he was very frightened and very concerned. And I sent him to live with my father. Now, my father and I were estranged. I hadn't spoken to him in months, didn't call him and ask his permission, just packed my son up and sent him to live with my father. And things got worse. Now I have no reason to hold on to any semblance of anything like responsible adulthood. So now I move from a three-room to a two-room to a one-room to, after a series of really poor decisions and circumstances, I wound up homeless. So when you've had a home and a car and a career and money and friends, and now you don't have any of that, and you don't have a connection. I didn't have a connection that I, my life had turned out like this as a result of alcohol. There was no clue, because I'm not an alcoholic. I don't know anything about alcoholism. You haven't heard anything about detox or rehab, because that's only for people who are trying to stop. And I had no intention of stop drinking. Drugs are also a part of my story, but I'm going to keep it on alcohol. But everything was going on. So now I'm living on the street. My first night homeless I spent on the E train, which is a very scary place late at night for a lady by herself. And then some other homeless people said that I could, um, if I went into the hospital waiting room at Queens General Hospital and didn't make any noise, the guard would let me come in at midnight and I could stay till six in the morning and then he would put me out. So that's how I lived. And then another homeless person said that if I got to Dunkin' Donuts at like six in the morning, I could get some donuts out of the dumpster in the back before they put the garbage on top of it. So that, I thought that was a really good idea. And if I kept my cup from the day before, I could go to McDonald's and they'd give me more coffee. So this is how I'm living. I'm wearing two pair of my son's pants. My possessions fit in a green plastic garbage bag. And I'm wearing some man's glasses. I don't even know where I got those from. And so this is how I'm living and I'm drinking. And I'm just basically waiting to die. I'm 38 years old. Um, I met a guy out there who drank and drugged the exact same way I did, and he said, boy, you are really sick. <laughs> and he said, would you come with me to a meeting? Like, what meeting? And we fought, because if you got between me and a drink, you had a problem on your hands. But he came back to this awful place that I was staying the next day, and he asked me again if for some reason I went. Well, I get to a meeting, and at the time the meetings were smoking meetings, and you people had cigarettes. I had now eliminated one problem I was having, because I could get cigarettes in the meeting. Aha, identification. <laughs> <laughs>
And there was coffee and cookies, and I'm half the time hungry. So I started coming every day. And I found out what time the guy with the keys got to the meeting, and I was there. Like two minutes after he showed up, I was there. So I came in, and I helped set up chairs, and I put the literature up, and I put slogans up, and I stood at the door, and I greeted people. Because I got a sponsor right away. I thought this was a good idea. They said men with the men, women with the women. I got a male sponsor. And my sponsor said, stand at the door and greet the people when they come in. I like this job. So I'm greeting people. Hi, my name is Linda. Come and I get them coffee and show them the literature, literature and introduce them to people with time. Now, I've been making meetings, you know, for several months. I have two days. And this person that I met at the door, 30 days later, they would have 30 days. I had one day back. Six months later, that person that I met at the door had six months. I had two days. A year later, that person was celebrating their first anniversary. I had 29 days. And I began to wonder. They were giving me this how it works thing to read all the time. And I thought they gave it to me to read because I'm very articulate. <laughs> and I thought they liked, you know, I have a nice, deep, rich voice. And I could read all the big words, so. And my sponsor wrote in my little notebook, which I had, he said, call me before you drink and get my permission. Now, I am sharing, I'm going to three meetings a day. I'm going to an afternoon meeting and a doubleheader at night, and I have no time. Um, and I'm sure I never heard them say it's the first drink. I never remember anyone ever saying that. Um, so I can just tell you from my own experience that you can make meeting after meeting after meeting and do tons of service, and that does not equal sobriety. Oh, and I lied at every meeting I went to about how many days I had. So at this meeting over here, I might have 15 days, but at that meeting over there, I might have 20, and then I had to keep them straight, and then that would make me want to drink because I'd get confused and messed it all up, you know. And I kept hearing them say, you have to get honest about your drinking. Well, I am grown, and alcohol is legal. It's none of your business. I, I just really had no clue, and I couldn't imagine. Okay, so if I stop drinking, look at the mess I've made of my life. I have no identification. By this time, my father had passed away. We, he passed away with us being estranged, so there was no forgiveness or anything there. I had not grieved the death of my mother from when she was 12. I am suffering with shame, guilt, and remorse from the lifestyle that I've been leaving and the career that I threw away and the son that I abandoned. And you're talking about not drinking. Well, anyway, one day after making 28 days for like the 58th time, I made a meeting. I had like 20 bucks that someone had given me, made three meetings, went home, should have been a good day, but this disease is cunning, baffling, relentless, deadly, powerful, and a few other adjectives. And at 11 o'clock at night, it said, get up and go get one. For some reason, this name, now I'm staying in some lady's attic. I'm not homeless anymore. Some lady has let me stay in her little attic. And uh, so I throw my coat on real quick because I'm gone, because there's nothing between me and a drink. But this time was a little different. You know, that sponsor that I had and three meetings a day for like almost two years, I had actually learned a little something. And this night, this, this night, I called my sponsor and I said really fast, hi, this is Linda. I'm, I want to drink. I have $20. You said to call you. I'm just calling you because I think he's going to give me permission because he understands why I got to go do this. But that's not what happened. So my sponsor, somewhere along the line, we said the serenity prayer together. I can't tell you what else he said, but he asked me then, so do you still want to drink? And I kind of felt around inside, and the feeling to drink had left. Pissed me off. Because <laughs> I told you, if you got between me and a drink, you had a problem. Now, here's the interesting thing. Sitting in meetings, I used to wonder about these suggestions, and I would try to figure them out. Like, if you were at your house and I'm at my house and I want to drink, how are you going to stop me? And I found out that if you think about the suggestions, they don't work. If you do the suggestions, they work. Because when that morning came, I caught my sponsor all night long, because all night long, 
the feeling the drink would come back. And I picked up the phone and I called him again. And I picked up the phone and I called him again. And he never said, look, would you stop calling me? You're waking up my family. Every time I call, he woke up and he talked me through it. So when the morning came, I had not left the house. I still had $20 in my pocket. And I can tell you that had never happened before. And I was like, wow. <laughs> like I had discovered something new. Like an alcoholic, if you called an alcoholic when you wanted to drink, you could actually get through a night of wanting to drink and not drink. So that told me that if I let you people help me, you could help me. But I wasn't, I wasn't sure about all the rest of the problems I had. Like the lady I was living with wanted rent. You know, um, my son and I were estranged. You know, I have no identification. I don't have keys. I have to be in at a certain time, leave at a certain time. You know, my life is a mess. My credit is shot. Um, while I was out there, I was raped and tortured and molested and beaten, and awful things happened to me, and I also did awful things. So this is how I'm sitting in the meetings now without a drink. So my sponsor started taking me through the steps. I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is a wreck. No problem with that one. <laughs> now this coming to believe in this higher power. Well, this was hard because I was still very angry at God. But what actually really helped me was the third step when he said, look, you've been running your life and you have made a mess out of it. Could you turn it over to someone else? And let's just see how it works. You can always go back to the insanity of running your own life. Okay, I can give that a shot. Um, then he said I had to take this fearless and thorough moral inventory of myself. Wow. But he said if I didn't do it, I would drink again. No, it was like no question. So I did it. It was the most wonderful thing. Now, I hated my sponsor. I have to tell you that. My sponsor said call him every day, and I called him at the, every day, and at the end of the conversation, I told him I hated his guts every day every day. Oh, and I also forgot to tell you that I thought all you people were stupid. Look at those stupid people. I just didn't get it. I was so arrogant and obnoxious. Um, so fourth step, I now find out I have character defects. This is new information. You know, and I did this list of looking at the seven deadly sins and resentment and fear. And then my sponsor said, write 20 positive things about yourself. Here's what I wrote. I'm tall. <laughs> that was all I could come up with. But I thank God for him because he helped me see that there were some other positive things about me. <laughs> so then I had to become willing to share that information that I discovered with God and another human being, which was so freeing. I had secrets, so many secrets, and I unloaded them all. And at the end of doing my fifth step, I fell in love with my sponsor because he looked at me the same way after I told him all the awful things as he did before. I was, it was, I kept waiting for him to go, ugh. He never did that. Uh, I went through the rest of the steps. You know, I made this list of people that um, I had to become willing to make amends to. They were pages. Because I'm that alcoholic roaring through the lives of their communities, their families. They were bodies strewn all over the place. But I began to see that if I didn't make those amends, if I didn't become willing and eventually make the amends, I couldn't hold my head up. I couldn't look myself in the mirror. And when you come out the gutter, the only way you can be a woman of dignity and honor and character is to face yourself. You know, the respect started with me. It actually started with my sponsor. And because he respected me, he never hit on me. You know, even though it was the men with the men, women with the women, we didn't follow that. He always treated me like a lady. I couldn't understand it. What lady did you see here? Um, so then I did a ten, you know, learned how to do a ten step to take my inventory throughout the course of the day, um, acknowledge when I'm right, keep my mouth shut, admit when I'm wrong right away as quickly as possible, and then to learn how to increase my conscious contact with God through prayer and meditation. You know, I told my sponsor one day and I said, "Okay, I'm done meditating." He said, "How long was that?" I said, two minutes." He said, "Very good," because I was like zip 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 zip. 
you know, I'm moving really fast most of the time, and two minutes of quiet. In fact, after I experienced my first two minutes of quiet, I called him because I was very uncomfortable, and I described it to him, and he said, it sounds like peace. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and then the 12th step, carry this message, help another alcoholic and keep the doors open. This is what it's all about. The only reason that God plucked me up out the gutter and dusted me off and put me in a suit and everything is so I, so that my experience may be able to help someone else. It's really not even about me. I'm done. I was done in that third step. So by the practice of these principles and trying to follow directions, I never followed a rule in my life. In fact, if you made a rule, I, like my boss said, you have to be at work from 9 to 5. I came in at 9.30. He changed my time to 9.30 to 5.30. I came in at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Um, but be, by following direction, my life has just become amazing. I mean, just amazing. So I like to share this part. At the age of 43, I went back to college. And how I went back to college was I heard an older woman like myself sharing at a meeting that she was in college. And I went up to her after the meeting and I said, do you think I can do that? She said, if I could do it, you could do it. So I went back to college. It took me six years at night because I made meetings. I worked a full-time job. I never stopped making meetings. I was also sponsoring people, taking them through 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. And it took me six years to graduate, but I graduated magna cum laude. And then at the age of 48, I went to law school. And I graduated from law school at 52. So if you're sitting here and you're like 29, <laughs> or 58, and you think it's too late, that too much time is gone, you've done too much damage with the alcohol, and you don't have any money. I didn't have any money, and God made a way. And I was able to work full time and go to law school at night. I didn't even know there were two brain cells still working in coordination. And I started very humbly, and I sat up front, and I listened to the professor. I raised my hand. I stayed after class. I had a study group. It was the hardest thing I ever did, but I did it. You know, now I took the bar exam a couple of times. And I actually am very proud of myself because I came very close. And you see what I'm saying? It's not always the attainment of the thing. Every day that I was blessed to show up in class and be a good student and, and remember one of 500 rules and laws that I had, I was really proud of myself, you know? And I share that. I, I may never take the bar exam again. I actually don't want to practice law, but I have a JD. I can command a little more money, which I do. And for my 56th birthday, which was two weeks ago, I took myself to Paris, France. That's all. <laughs> So I don't share those things to brag. I, my life consisted of like four blocks, like a bodega, a liquor store, a spot, and the hole in the wall that I was in. And, and when, I, when I got sober, I found out there was a world out there. But I remember asking my sponsor, why was it that I hear other people come to meetings and they have two homes, three cars, a wife, the kids, never lost any of that. Why did I have to lose everything before I got sober? He said, because you wouldn't stop while you had anything left. Because I had it. I had a great job, a nice home, and I drank it away. And then I used to think that if you had that stuff, you weren't the same kind of alcoholic as I was. But here's the reality. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have. It doesn't matter whether you were one of ten children or a single a, uh, an only child. It doesn't matter if you had both parents or one parent or your grandmother raised you. We all wind up here. So it doesn't matter how you get here. And then I began to feel, that's why I start my sharing with Hello Family. Most of you I've met for the first time tonight, and I felt so warm and so invited and so connected when I walked in here. This 
is still the most important thing in my life. And going to school and working and doing service and I'm writing a book and I'm starting a business, I make meetings. I've been blessed to take maybe 30 people through 12 steps and 12 traditions. It is my favorite kind of service. And I like the newcomer coming through the door who's just like me. Clueless, number one, with no desire to stop drinking, and who's got a lot of problems. Oh, I just love them. <laughs> because I have something for them. There's no problem they could tell me about that I haven't had. And I stayed sober once I got sober. And I didn't get sober the first day my behind hit the chair. So some, you know, some of us takes a little while. I'm glad no one ever gave up on me. In fact, when I didn't show up at a meeting, old timers came and got me. We, we don't do as much of that stuff today. But some of the old timers would come to the place I was staying and rev the engine outside and I would sometimes pick, pick out the window. Sometimes I could come out and sometimes I couldn't. But they came for me. So I do that kind of service. I have a 24-7 number. There's no time that you can't call me because someone answered that phone when I called at 2 o'clock in the morning and at 4 o'clock in the morning and at 6 o'clock in the morning, even though they had to get up and go to work. So people call. My house, the phone rings 24-7, and I'm grateful. So I don't stay on the phone all night. Are you going to drink? Okay, let's say a serenity prayer, calm down, we'll talk for a few minutes, make a meeting when you get up. And I move on, and I go back to sleep. And I think if you're open to doing that kind of service, God gives you the energy and the strength and the courage to deal with the hard situations. This program works if you're new, if you're here for a while and struggling. In fact, if you're here and you have time and you don't have a newcomer in your life, get busy. Get busy. That's how you get that energy back. That's how come I'm enthusiastic now. I got a new newcomer. And she's like getting a clue that she can actually do 24 hours without a drink. I haven't forgotten what that's like. My prayer every day when I get up is, thank you, God, for waking me up this morning. Please help me stay away from a drink today, 16 and a half years later. And I go through the day, and I thank him all day long. And at the end of the day, I say thank you. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.